so thank you everybody for joining us here today um, for live from the studio with Alana Clamp. My name is Jazz Keeler and I am the contract virtual programs curator at Griffin Art Projects. So I'm just going to quickly share my screen again here. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Griffin Art Projects is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the tsleil Squamish, and Stolo nations, and we are honored and grateful to undertake our work here. Um, I just wanted to quickly mention that if you would like to see live captions displayed for today's presentation, you can enable this by selecting the CC Live Transcription button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and I always note that it's not perfectly accurate and names in particular tend to be trickier, but we do hope that it is helpful in capturing most of what we are saying. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to mention that if you're experiencing um, any technical issues at all with Zoom, then we always do live stream these videos from Griffin's Facebook page. So that's just a really easy way to troubleshoot um, if you're experiencing any audio issues or anything like that. Um, you can also watch this video from our Facebook page. So I'll just quickly stop sharing my screen. Um, the last kind of housekeeping note that I have today is just to let you know that we're in Zoom's webinar format. And that just means that we cannot see or hear audience members, um, but we do invite you to get in touch with us using the chat dialog box at the bottom of your screen. And I'll also mention that there will be uh, time for questions at the end of the talk. So if at any point you have any questions that you'd like to ask Alana, feel free to type them in the Q&A dialog box. And I'll just point out that it's actually separate from the chat. You'll find it to, your, to the left of the chat. Um, and that's where we'll be checking for the Q&A portion of the presentation. And at that point, there'll also be the opportunity to ask your questions out loud. So if that's your preference, feel free to indicate that in the Q&A. Um, or you can also raise a virtual hand, which is just that yellow hand at the bottom of your screen. Um, and that will just let me know that you'd like to be unmuted once we get to the Q&A. Okay, so that's all of my notes and um, I'm really honored to introduce Alana Clamp. Alana is an artist from North Vancouver. She has her Bachelor of Fine Arts in Photography from Emily Carr, a Bachelor in Art History from Concordia University, and a Master's in Fine Art from the Glasgow School of Art in Scotland. And Alana has exhibited her photographic and video work in Canada, the UK, and South Africa. And she's been in residence here at Griffin since March 18th. So so thank you so much, Alana, for being with us here today. And we're just so looking forward to hearing more about your practice and what you've been up into, what you've been up to in the studio um, these past few months. So I'll go ahead and pass it over to you. Hi, thanks for that. Um, okay, I guess I'm going to do a quick introduction of what I've been doing mostly here in the studio. So I thought I would talk um, more specifically about some research I had I had done and have been continuing to do in relation to the project I'm working on here. Um, and so to begin, I'm just, just going to share my screen. There we go. Share. Okay. Okay. So the current research project I am doing looks at the relationship between objects and healing and historical medical practices and how we can use that framework to think about our relationship to contemporary art objects. I'm going to start by describing healing rituals in ancient Mesopotamia, and then I'm going to discuss some shifts that occurred during the European Middle Ages, specifically during the first wave of the bubonic plague. I started my research in ancient Mesopotamia after picking up a book on medical history from a charity shop. The title of the book was The Greatest Benefit to Mankind by Rory Potter. It's, a, it's like a large um, overview of medical history. Although I like the book, I recognize that this is an extremely grandiose title. And the book focuses almost exclusively on a kind of Western medical tradition without much self-reflection on that. Um, that aside, uh, so the book starts in Mesopotamia largely because Mesopotamia has a significant amount of scholarship focused on the subject of medical history. This is partially because it is understood in the, it is understood in the Western tradition of medicine to be sort of one of the birthplaces of how like uh, um, Western medicine will continue to evolve. 
Um, but also it's because Mesopotamia it was shockingly bureaucratic and there are plenty of remaining records and sort of like um, information, tablets and pharmaceutical guides. So here is, here is a, an image of some cylinder seals. So cylinder seals essentially function as a security signature for individuals. They were made of stone and engraved with the design. The roller was used to imprint a positive image on clay. These seals would be used to, to secure goods like jars and boxes and baskets. So they're essentially used like in a very similar way to a wax seal on an envelope, except they would be more for like three dimensional objects like, uh, yeah, like baskets or boxes. And this would just ensure that during the trade of goods, like nothing was tampered with and nothing was stolen. So this cylinder seal was for a physician and it features the healing goddess Gula. So you can see Gula is sitting, she's the one on the, the, the throne or the, the chair here. And she's sitting on the back of her dog. She faces right and she has her hand raised as she holds a scalpel. And in her left hand is a beaded ring. She wears a tall headdress with a necklace and a wide belted tiered robe. Behind her on the chair, behind the chair are four stars, a crescent and a figure. Facing Gula is a worshiper who's pointing with his right hand and he extends his left. He has shoulder length hair, which you can see there. So the inclusion of scalpels and depictions of Gula are common and she is often showing holding a scalpel in addition to another object. In this instance, that object is the beaded ring. However, the frequency at which the scalpels are represented is surprising because rarely are scalpels mentioned within any of the medical texts. And there is little evidence to point to the fact that the physicians would act as surgeons because this was in the jurisdiction of barbers. Considering this, that physicians did not perform surgeries themselves, then why is the healing goddess shown with a scalpel? The answer is the scalpel is a prop. The scalpel is not intended to cut, it's intended to scare. The reason for this is because the Mesopotamians believed that illness was caused from ghosts occupying the patients. The term the hand of the ghost is so regularly used to describe that it becomes shorthand for describing illness and sickness in general. So the scalpel isn't used to scare the patient who also understands that they are being possessed by a ghost, but the scalpel is used to scare the ghost who is occupying the patient. So basically during a healing ritual, the scalpel would be used to sort of um, demand that the ghost like almost like an exorcism or something a little like different but something similar close sim more similarly to that so take for instance one dramatic healing ritual the ritual stipulates that the priest ties a goat to the patient's bed and the and then the priest goes ahead and touches the goat's throat or slices the throat to sacrifice it placing the goat's dead body on the patient in a hope that the disease will pass from the patient to the goat this literally makes this, the goat the scapegoat. In this instance, the scapegoat provides an intermediary host for the disease itself to move into. The scapegoat is an example, the scapegoat in this example is not the sickness itself. The scapegoat is providing an alternative for the patient. So the phrase, the scalpel of Gula, which is often used in healing spells and likely what the cylinder seal that we're seeing here is referring to is a threat to the ghost. In one recorded healing spell, a physician is trying to remove something from an eye and yells, go away before the blade and the knife will reach you. So again, referring to the ghost that's occupying the patient. Different illnesses have different ghosts and require different treatments. For instance, one curious but frequently repeated example is a ghost is the ghost of Lilith or maiden Lilith. The story of Lilith is that she was never married and dies childless. As a result, she now routinely seeks out sex with susceptible human partners, which manifests in depression, mostly for young unmarried women. The record, the recorded remedy for having been haunted by or having been occupied by Lilith is to perform a marriage ritual in lieu of the wedding ceremony that, that Lilith failed to get in her own life. This includes sculpting male and female figures out of dough and marrying them in a short wedding ceremony. Both the incantations and the scalpel are used as a way to communicate directly with illness. However, the actual performance is for the patient who is now afforded the ability to occupy the role of passive spectator. 
This potentially functions in several ways, but importantly, it allows a division between the theater of healing and the authentic experience of the patient. In this regard, it does not matter if the patient understands the threat to be empty because they are not the final intended audience. The patient is also entitled to understand the diseases separate from themselves in both spirit and body when they are invited to view the healing ritual from these conceptual sidelines. This is at odds with later conceptions of disease, which slowly seem to occup become the essence of the patient. By threatening the disease and not the patient with the knife, the scalpel of Gula, the patient is able to cease to be the sickness themselves because, they are, because the performance allocates a divide. So I'm gonna show a quick video work that uh, was basically inspired by the, this story of Lilith. We want horses with large rib cages. Why do we want large rib cages? Because that is heart and lung capacity. It's also the capacity to eat food, to digest that food, and then utilize that food for performance. So we need to have an animal that has some capacity. But how do we measure that? Remember that it's a cylinder. Sorry, uh, could you, I can't tell if you can hear, sorry, I can't tell, could you hear the video? We could, yeah. Okay, Perfect. okay. <laughs> All right, I'll start again, sorry. Um, share screen. We want horses with large rib cages. Why do we want large rib cages? Because that is heart and lung capacity. It's also the capacity to eat food, to digest that food, and then utilize that food for performance. So we need to have an animal that has some capacity. But how do we measure that? Remember that it's a cylinder, and cylinders are deep and circular in shape and relatively long. So we want some length from elbow to stifle. We want them long in their underline. We want them deep in their heart girth, arch and spring of rib, and some real capacity to the rib cage and middle. Moving up to the head, all heads have to be functional in some capacity. They have to be able to see, they have to be able to breathe, they have to be able to eat, and they have to be able to hear appropriately. And to that end, we can talk about some things that are valued in all horses' heads. That's a head that's relatively short, a head that's deep through the jaw, has a large bright eye, large nostrils so they can take in a lot of air, shallow mouth and teeth that meet well in front. Next is the shoulders. How do you determine the angle of the shoulder? There's a number of people that will talk about trying to find the groove down the shoulder, all sorts of things like that. And it's difficult to do based on a couple of things. One, the grooves vary by horse, and two, it varies by condition of the horse. As you might guess, in a really thin horse, it's very easy to see the scapula, and in a very fat horse, it's sometimes impossible to see the scapula. How do we evaluate that? The best thing is use two reference points that don't change, one of which is the point of the shoulder. The second is the midpoint of the withers, because we know that the withers are made up of the spinous processes and the scapula that comes in like this. Um, okay, so in this video, let's see if I can pause it where we were. So in this video, I basically recreated this like prescribed Mesopotamian ritual um, by trying to create two doe characters and then have, well, I didn't really have a wedding for them. That felt a little bit far, but I, uh, I did put them together. Um, and I think at the time I was, I was sort of, I was feeling a little depressed myself. And I was like, if that worked in Mesopotamia for someone at one point, like, is there too much harm in trying? Um, 
So I, yeah, but so, and then the, and then the overlay of this video is um, a man discussing how to purchase, like what to look for when you're purchasing a racehorse. And I like the juxtaposition of these two. And then on the bottom is like some paper, some other paper cutouts that I was like working through. And I like the juxtaposition of this sort of very analytical description of a horse's body and a really displaced sense of like um, self within that judgment of the horse, which is at odds for me with this kind of like much more ritualistic and spiritual um, version of how to heal the body in these like Mesopotamian rituals. Okay, so and then so after after sort of this period, I became more interested in the Middle Ages. Um, so my interest in this subject took me to the Middle Ages, where disease conceptions continue to be splintered. However, the appeals are no longer made to diseases or ghosts themselves, but to God. So there's a um, homogenization, like where there would be different ghosts for different diseases. Suddenly, there is essentially one authority on all sickness and all health, and this authority is God. So here is an image of the patron saint of the bubonic plague, which is Saint Roche. The saint exposes his plague bulbus for which the bubonic plague was named. This is called a plague gesture. After someone was infected, their lymph nodes would swell to create bulbuses, which, were, which is where the bubonic plague received its name. If the flea infected the patient below the waist, it would be the groin lymph node, which was infected and swollen. So that's what's happened in this instance. If it was above the waist, it would be the armpit lymph node. In this instance, Saint Roche, who is also the patron saint of dogs, is seen with his dog at the bottom. This is because fleas, which carried the plague, preferred the warmer bodies of dogs. People who had pets initially had better survival rates because the fleas would first infect their animals. This image here is a plague votive. A plague votive is a specific style of painting which functions as a talisman or good luck charm to ward off sicknesses. In this instance, obviously, it would be, have been to ward off the plague. In a similar way to how Gulliff's scalpel is meant for the ghost, this image is meant for God. These plague votives, in which there were many, are meant to be appeasements to God. Often the votives would show pleading scenes of suffering, and the goal was to gain the sympathies of God so that the, so that the patient or the individual was spared. Sometimes these votives included images of angels stopping arrows from the sky. The, a the arrows were symbols of the plague being rained down from the heavens, which again underscores this idea that God both can, is the one who's producing the disease or at least allowing the devil to do it, and that God then also has the power to prevent it. The implication here, yeah, is that God has the power on either side. It can be hard to re-see these works and similar works. Religious paintings in the Middle Ages are often discussed through a modern lens in which the painting is primarily a document to communicate information to people. They take on the language of historical paintings because of their precision and their usefulness in this regard. However, votives like this were primarily spiritual objects and were intended to be the audience of God in addition. So, and so here I, I really liked, another thing about these plague votives is often like the, because there was like people wanted to be chased and they didn't want to be too revealing in the images. So the plague bulbous could present itself essentially anywhere on the leg. Like it was, it was very rough. Like it, there was nothing particularly anatomical or there was no reality they were trying to copy in that sense. So I really like these images and I like this idea that there's a gesture that's supposed to sort of, or a posture that you can take to um, gain the sympathies of God. So I made my own. And this one I'm beginning to use, like, obviously it's not real and it's not supposed to be real, but I kind of like the fluidity in that. And um, yeah, so here is, here's my sort of rendition. Um, another treatment during the bubonic plague I found interesting was the consumption of emeralds. Initially, if you were sick, it was good enough to have emeralds close to your body. Emeralds could be worn as a ring or in an amulet or even a crown. This belief was so persistent that in, 19, that in, in 1938 pharmaceutical works by Jean Renault, he discusses 
uh, oh, sorry, a 1638. I was like 19, that sounds too late. In 1638 in pharmaceutical works, Jean Renaud discusses about whether or not emeralds had healing properties, but rather how to utilize them to their best effect. Renaud claims that although emeralds are naturally the most powerful of all the stones, they are also the laziest. Lazy does not mean that they're not effective though. It just means it requires more prompting. So, so essentially there's this idea, especially with gemstones, and I didn't know this before I started looking into it, but that's why gemstones are in the crown uh, for royalty is the idea that the healing properties need to be as close to the person as possible. And a ring and a crown is pretty close. But during the plague, obviously like eating, like uh, these emeralds are not, they're not effective. So what ended up happening is people started consuming emeralds. So they were eating them. Um, so eating emeralds uh, was basically, it sort of reveals this idea that there's this understanding that there, there's a medicinal factor, there's a positive healing power to them, but just close or on the body wasn't enough because the patient was still sick. So suddenly they were crushing them up and obviously just for the wealthiest of people, but then they were consuming them. So I think, that's my next one. So this is, this is, I, this is a, um, an image I made uh, which features these emeralds. So out of the sheer panic of the bubonic plague emerges new levels of desperation. It's during this time that the cult of saints and relics balloons as a response to the massive wave of death. Shrines were, shrines were set up for believers and patients to visit. However, ironically, the practice of visiting saints' shrines in times of pestilence likely made the problem of disease contagion worse by spreading the sickness through the shrine and all the people there touching it. For instance, the shrine for St. Roche in Venice was shut in 1529 because there was eventually ended up being some concern that it, it was becoming a hotspot for disease. None of these histories are tidy, but in general, the trauma of the bubonic plague increased the popularity of reliquaries. Relics provided additional opportunities to heal sick bodies by being in close proximity to the idealized pure bodies of saints. This is a similar logic to I explained earlier with the emeralds needing to be ingested in order to increase their potency. The term relic is typically applied to the material remains of a saint after their death and uh, after their death, so any object from their body or an object that was close to their body um, gains this sort of significant power or this understanding of a significant power. In contrast to the portable, relatively interchangeable healing props that I discussed earlier in Mesopotamia, the relics are themselves considered sacred and finite because of their direct origin to a limited body. So we're sort of healing objects uh, within like these these rituals were largely interchangeable. There's this move to suddenly have these objects be incredibly limited and precious because they had, there was only one body they could be in relation to, which was this former saint's body. So this lends itself to a very different culture of healing props and objects because this scarcity um, demands a, an entirely different viewing context. The relic is uh, is remarkable and potent because it has been in actual physical contact with, or is indeed derived from the substance of a saint. There is no reproducing the power of this object. And suddenly authenticity, the authenticity of an object becomes incredibly important. There is no metaphor or symbol here. The relics are not like the saint, they are the saint. So what does this have to do with art and understanding of art objects? So, um, German scholar Christoph Dietrich argues that the moment, the movement from touching and handling magic objects to placing objects in reliquaries had far reaching art historical and devotional consequences. The medium of veneration turns the objects, um, the believer from spectator and face to face interactions with them to something of a removed and distant contemplation. For him, this is a starting point for externalization in which objects over time are no longer serving as conduits of, sac of the sacred, but the objects are now within the realm of a kind of disinterested contemplation. The relics, especially the significant ones, are stationary. So it is the job of the sick and the pilgrim to move towards the objects and not the other way around. Additionally, with this increased traffic and religious value,